Hey guys, welcome to the show today. Armin Gunn here, and we've got a bunch of belt feds for you guys to look at. Today I'm going to tell you what a belt fed is, why it's important, you know, I guess militarily speaking, how they're used, a bit of history on their development. Fun fact, the belt fed was actually the first true automatic firearm. And of course, I'll give you a rundown on the four belt feds we have here today. Now, quick disclaimer, <laughs> this, this video is following shortly on the heels of my 2021 update, which uh, proved to be a bit controversial. I do apologize for the dis deceptive clickbaity title. I did not expect a lot of pushback from it, but uh, nonetheless, I got some. So I thought, you know what, let's just address that. For those of you who got taken for the ride, I apologize. And uh, we're not going to be doing any more clickbait on this channel. It was purely meant as a spicy way to kick off the new year, which is going to be full of a lot of solid things. And so again, in full clarity to any of those that, uh, that missed the joke, my wife is very much still, <laughs> still, I'm still very much so married. My wife is simply... Uh, take a, took a work gig out in the Nevada desert to flex her mechanical engineering skills and we'll be back in about a month. In the meantime, you guys can expect some additional content coming out to make up for my two-week break over the holidays. So kicking things off, what is a belt fed? Well, we'll jump down here to the M60. Essentially, a belt fed is a type of firearm that is fed by ammunition, not through a magazine, but rather through linked cartridges, either through disintegrating links like this a fixed belt like this, non-disintegrating, or even a cloth belt. And there are actually some other techniques in the early days of belt feds as well, such as strips and things like that. But essentially what happens is there's a mechanism that continually grabs and cycles links through the action. Um, the very famous one, which was actually made famous by, people say the MG42, but actually the MG34 had it first. And it's this idea of a feed pawl system. This starts by laying ammunition in the feed tray. It's retained by this little uh, foot right there, spring-loaded foot, that's sloped so that it retains the belt on the feed. And then you have a system which, in this case, a mechanical system that's controlled by the, run by the action, that manipulates these little things called feed pawls. And basically, they're two little arms that are spring-loaded, so they, they pop down like that. So basically, in the process of this moving over, they'll come over, they'll, sp they'll spring down over a top of the cartridge, spring back up behind it, and then on the return stroke, it'll get pushed back up again into the feedway. And whether the gun is gas operated or recoil operated, that's uh, basically just going to continue that, that process. So that's what a belt fed is and uh, how it kind of functions internally. But why is it important and why are they so widely used by militaries in certain roles? Well, by and large, belt feds are designed to basically send a lot of fire downrange. And for that to be efficient and effective, you can't be changing out magazines every 20 or 30 rounds. So instead, belt feed mechanisms are employed that can loop anywhere from 50 to essentially unlimited supplies of ammunition through the gun. So you have ammunition on tap and it's basically just keeps flowing as long as you pull the trigger, effectively eliminating ammunition feed as a bottleneck for running your gun. Instead, you have to worry about overheating. And that's primarily just an issue with the barrel, which is why it's very common for belt fed guns to employ quick change barrels. All four of these guns here do have a quick change barrel. Though you could argue the M2 isn't a true quick, well, it's, it's pretty quick change. We'll talk about that and why it's not 100% quick change in a second. And in terms of military use, there's another interesting distinction to make, and that is the difference between heavy machine gun, medium machine gun, light machine gun, and squad automatic weapon. And that's a topic I'll look to cover in another video, but in the meantime, Ian from Forgotten Weapons does have a great breakdown of those classifications and distinctions. Now let's take a quick stab at the history, and then we'll give you the rundown on each of the guns and kind of why they were significant. The belt fed system, and actually honestly the modern automatic machine gun, can largely be attributed back to and credited to Hiram Maxim, who was a pretty brilliant dude back in the mid 1800s. Some likened him to like Thomas Edison, he was apparently quite brilliant for his inventions. He had a ton of patents and was even developing things like the modern light bulb, which apparently was ruffling some feathers, so his business partners of all people had him sent to England and Europe to basically develop a better way, the quote was, develop a better system for Europeans to slit each other's throats with. And they paid him a pretty handsome salary of like 20 grand, which in the mid 1800s is a ton of money, uh, 20 grand per year to, uh, to go bugger off to Europe and get it done. Now at the time, the guns that were kind of considered, you know, the machine guns of the day were all manually operated. So in a sense, they weren't automatic. They all basically employed hand cranks, things of that nature, basically to keep them going. And in many cases, they didn't have a very fast fire rate anyways. So Maxim began experimenting and designing and happened upon the belt feed system, which was kind of derived from some of the earlier chain-fed guns. 
but this was honestly a pretty revolutionary new system. And then he further developed the whole operational mechanics so that the operation of the firearm itself, like extracted the old round, reloaded the new one, all without the use of anything further than basically your thumb to depress the button on the gun. He took his initial prototype gun around Europe and to different trials and things like that, and basically just decimated the competition who wasn't even in the same league. I'm skipping a bit here, but his gun eventually became known as the Maxim, which was heavily popular, and just about everyone was using it from all sides in World War I. Many countries licensed and built them and made their own improvements, though it was actually Vickers, who later associated with Maxim and kind of bought out his company, who pretty much perfected the design in uh, the well-known Vickers gun, which is essentially a Maxim with its action inverted so that it could get to be basically housed in a much smaller receiver, decreasing its size and weight. Now, those guns were all water-cooled. I don't have any examples of water-cooled guns here because that technology largely went by the wayside at least in the forefront after World War I, and people began developing air-cooled guns because they were much lighter and more portable. And it was actually the Lewis gun from World War I, which is likely partly to thank for this because it was used very well, essentially in the role of a light machine gun. It was essentially, yeah, it could be considered one of the light, earliest light machine guns, though I suppose the actual title of the earliest machine gun would go to the Madsen design. So following World War I, a lot of the powers realized how important machine guns were and uh, were a bit boondoggled by the sheer number of variants they had. You know, there were heavy machine guns, medium machine guns, light machine guns, and Germany was the first to take, well, was probably the most well known for taking the first stab at consolidating all the guns into a single platform, basically creating the GPMG class or the general purpose machine gun class. And they did that with their MG34, which is this guy right here. I've got lots of videos out on that. Actually, I got videos on all three of these guns right here, just not the M2, not quite yet anyways. But the general purpose machine gun was meant to be pretty flexible. It could be used in tanks, used by ground crews, used in airplanes, and had a lot of kind of neat features like this removable buttstock, which again makes it shorter length. When it's hooked up into a mount, it can be then run in the tank without having this bulky buttstock sticking in the back. They also made up a number of different tripods, different mounts, to kind of transform the gun between a light machine gun or more of a, a medium machine gun roll, which by World War II definitions was a 30 cal-ish gun in kind of more of a fixed place roll where it can just lay down continuous amounts of suppressive fire. That would have been considered a heavy machine gun by World War I definitions, but uh, in World War II you now have 50 cal belt fed guns, which are now considered the heavy machine guns. This concept of a general purpose machine gun became so successful in World War II that many other countries chose to adopt something similar going forward. The Russians were the, well, you can argue the Americans with their BAR, but they kind of just scabbed parts onto the BAR to kind of make it more versatile. I'm looking at you, 1919A6. And probably the next most popular gun that followed the MG34 and MG42 was done by the Russians in the early 60s, and that was another Kalashnikov design, the PK, which later became the PK Modernized, otherwise known as the PKM. And that gun has probably gone down. I think I've seen every person on YouTube that's, that's handled them and has any experience with these guns at large state that it's like their favorite belt-fed, favorite general purpose machine gun ever. Go figures, leave it to the guy that designed the AK-47 to develop the best belt-fed as well. Now, the funny thing is the MG-42, which was built alongside the MG-34 here, um, that and the PKM represent most of the modern machine guns today. There's, they're still super widely used. Um, the MG42 is the MG3 now, it's 7.62 NATO, it's used by a ton of countries in Europe. And of course the PKM and its modern variants have been used, are, are still in use by a ton of countries as well. Rounding out the gap is pretty much the Bravo M240. Again, these are, these are guns that are roles as general purpose machine guns. You wouldn't consider the 249 saw or slash mini me, that wouldn't be in this role. That's more of a light machine gun slash squad automatic. But it's just fun to see how some of these basic designs have become so prevalent and uh, mainstream now today. And the 240, by FN basically incorporated again this MG34 feet mechanism along with the side plate design that uh, the Browning 1919, the Browning 30 cal, and of course the Browning 50 cal made use of. In more recent history, there's some there's some new developments now by SIG and, and HK and whatnot that are are looking pretty promising. They're once again modern versions designed around that uh, GPMG concept, and it's going to be curious to see where they go going forward. One interesting thing to note with the designs going forward is the seemingly adoption of new calibers, basically cartridge designs that are more efficient so that you have more terminal ballistics further down range, and then they're more accurate when laying down suppressive fire in a specific area. But that's GPMGs. On the light machine gun slash squad automatic side of things, there's definitely been a uh, some efforts to reduce the size and weight of the platform 
to basically, uh, this gun right here, it's a Fight Light MCR, Mission Configurable Rifle, that's the same platform as an AR-15, takes the same lower, and it's not much heavier, and it does benefit from both magazine-fed and belt-fed capabilities, while having a uh, quick-change barrel. So that's pretty slick. And again, all these guns basically employ a various method to quickly change the barrel. All of them require having the bolt back. And then, uh, yeah, this one's got a little latch mechanism right here. And then as mentioned with the M2, so this is kind of just a quirk of the day. There was a later variant that was designed to be quick change truly. Um, however, this one, due to absolutely tons of these things being manufactured for World War II by a bunch of different manufacturers, manufacturing techniques of the day weren't quite sophisticated enough to control tolerances across a bunch of manufacturers on something as important and crucial as the headspace of the rifle. You get that wrong on a small enough gun with a weak enough caliber and you can uh, blow the gun up. But when you're talking 50 BMG, which is a high pressure round, there's, there's a lot going on there. And if that detonates, you know, out of battery or not quite with the right headspace, you're gonna, you can blow up the gun. So the solution to that was to make the barrels fairly quick change. However, they don't automatically headspace. So when you thread a new barrel in, it ratchets in, you actually have to ma manually check the headspace um, before proceeding. Then when you're all done, it looks something like that. Ian, again from Forgotten Weapons, had a uh, good video recently about the M2, and he actually showed you how to go through the headspace and the timing of the gun, which is really cool, because I actually haven't seen that anywhere else on YouTube just yet. And I gotta say, with the barrel in there, that's like 85 pounds, and that's a testament to uh, how solid these wall systems are. Nonetheless, guys, that pretty much wraps up the video today. In case you didn't catch it, we have the Fight Light MCR in 5.56. We have the ever-famous German MG34 in 8mm Mauser, though you can also find 308 kits for those, which is pretty cool. We have the M60, the US Pig. This gun borrowed heavily from both the MG32-34 system, essentially copying the top feed system. It's also quite based off of the German FG42 as well, uh, which is a pretty cool gun. And then the, the, the Browning, the M2, 50 cal. This thing is the longest serving belt fed. Apart from, I mean, the Maxims and the Vickers served a long time, but this one has been in service with the, with the mil U.S. military for coming up 90 years, which is just phenomenal. They've tried to replace it a number of times. They just haven't been able to do it. Truly a testament to, uh, to John Browning's Maxim Maven belt at the belt fed. I think I have to give it to, uh, to Mr. Browning for the win. Anyways, guys, thanks a ton. A lot of fun content coming this year. We're going to have some full auto stuff, including full auto belt feds. If you like my content, again, those classic five things, please like, comment, share, subscribe. Follow me on Instagram at arm.and.gun. Definitely appreciate that. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks a ton. Arm and Gun, out.